All right, here we are with the first um, Ask Dr. P session of the um, Central Wells Chemistry course. And um, I want to get started off first. Uh, the first question that was submitted was by Heather Nielsen. So, Heather, if you want to take it away, I'll uh, highlight you here and tell you when to go here. Here you are. Oh, here we go. Okay, Heather, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Pappas. So my question was, are there any essential oils that are similar in chemical composition to steroids, something like pregnizone or something like that? Oh, yes, okay. Um, this is a, I think, uh, there's quite a few people spreading this, and I pr probably should do a myth about this. Um, I'm going to share with you a whiteboard so that I can kind of demonstrate um, what I really want to say about this. And I'm going to try to draw. To be a steroid, a molecule has to have this specific basic five ring structure, which basically consists of three six membered rings. And I'm sorry for my shaky drawing here. Oop, let me clear that. There are two six-membered rings that are side by side. Then there's one kind of up like this. Ah, not doing a very good job of drawing this. Change the color here. Okay. And then there's a five member ring at the end. So you've got six, 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 and five. This structure is the basic backbone of a steroid. You have to have this in order to be classified as a steroid. Um, there are no essential oil molecules that have this sort of structure. There's none that are even close to this. The molecular weight of steroids are much higher than your typical essential oil molecules. And so there's really nothing in essential oils that could ever act as a steroid in the same way because the way th things act in the body are through sort of, as you probably know, this sort of um, hand and glove type relationship, right? So there's no way that any essential oil molecule could fit into a, a receptor site or whatever um, that a normal steroid would would fit into. So you're not going to have essential oil molecules given these kinds of effects. Anybody have any questions about that? Any follow up on that at all? Well, it might lead into my question four. Would an extract of a plant, since it can handle heavier molecule weight, be able to hand, or be able to have any of those structures in it? That's that's getting into another thing. And yes, we'll address that when we get to that question. Okay. Yeah, but but in terms of essential oil molecules, if people are if you run into people claiming that you know, this essential oil, that essential oil is gonna act like a steroid. It's not possible. A lot of people will say things like, um, clary sage has estrogen effects or whatever. And that's because of the scleriol that's in the clary sage. But if you look at the structure of scleriol, you'll see that it's not anything close to a steroid. Scleriol is, prob is probably one of the largest molecules that you'll see in essential oil. Actually, it might be the largest, there may be one or two slightly bigger but that's pretty much your limit and it's not going to act like a steroid it doesn't have proper structure 
Okay, let's move on to Marianne. All right, thank you for including my question. And I can tell this is gonna be interesting all along the way. How important is it for oils to be sourced from plants that are nurtured in their native environment? Um, for instance, as opposed to lavender that's grown and nurtured in France, do you see a different chemistry in lavender that's grown somewhere else? So how important is that natural environment to the uh, Yes, chemistry? it's it's actually very important. Um, you will see variation. You can see substantial variation in the chemistry of essential oils uh, based upon where they're grown. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that if something is grown in a non-traditional location, that it's not going to be as good as a traditional location. In some cases, we've even seen things that are better. I'll give you an example. Hmm. Um, it's been a few years, but Steven Seagal used to grow helichrysum oil back in I don't know, early 2000s. And he had, a, he had a ranch out in California. It's called Diamond Lotus Ranch. I don't know if any, any of you ever heard of that or knew about that but he was selling little bottles of his own essential oils there for a while and he contacted me to do his all of his analysis and i'm talking about steven seagal that the actor mm -hmm. um and his helichrysum that he produced on that ranch was the best i'd ever seen this is in northern california hmm. oh. so we traditionally think of um you know corsican helichrysum as being the best and it is it's it's the best that's available today but the product that he was producing in that area just below the base of Mount Shasta in Northern California, in my opinion, was the best helichrysum I've ever seen. It, it had the highest level of uh, diketones, which is what you want to look for in a really good helichrysum is that high, high diketone level. And his had like, some of his samples were at like 20% diketone, which is off the chart, you know? So, Yes, it's important. Um, it is a factor to be, you know, it, and when plants are growing in their native area, it, it is going to give that specific chemistry. But that doesn't always mean that it's the best chemistry. We discover new things when we try, you know, new areas for the, you know, and that's going to be an area that's going to be ongoing as the world supply of essential oils becomes more and more tapped. So, so basically, it's just important to know that there is a reputable tester you know, examining the oils that you use That's rather correct. than for sure where they're, they're from. Right. Right. Yes. Can we maybe compare that to uh, different wines and that how, you know, people in the industry talk about the terroir of a wine. Can that maybe apply to where the plants are grown to produce the essential oils? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of there's there's a lot of similarities in the wine industry and the essential oil industry. You know, it's all it's a, it's science and yet it's art at the same time. And um, all there's a million little things that go into the production of essential oil that can change the you know the chemistry of it. And it's not just about the climate. It's not just about the soil. It's just not just about the region. But the production method, there's there's just millions of variables, really. And so all of that's a factor. You know, it, it is similar to sewer winemaking, I think. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, next up is Lori. Thank you. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you for this. I, I'm excited. I think this is a very much needed question and answer for everybody that is into essential oils. And my question was pertaining to ingestion of oils. I think that there's been so much controversy, whether it's good, bad, evil, whatever. I mean, we really would like some clarification on that. And then the second part of my question was what actually is the difference between an essential oil that we purchase from our favorite wholesaler versus the oils that people can buy in the grocery store to put in cakes and cookies and those types of things. Okay. Well, that's a touchy subject and I'm not really one who usually gets into issues of usage. Um, I would tell people that if they're drinking essential oils, that's not a good idea. Like 
straight out of a bottle, just actually guzzling a half ounce of essential oil. That's not going to be good. <laughs> um, but it's become very popular to put drops of oil in water, as we know. And the problem with that is not that it, it, it can be harmful, but you know, it depends on the degree of what you're doing. I mean, I myself, I'll put a drop of peppermint in my water occasionally. But you have to be aware that essential oils do not dissolve in water. Right. And so if you're putting 10 drops of oil in your water, that they're just going to create an oil layer on top of that water that's going to float on top. You can shake it up, but it's going to come right back to the top. And when you, if you drink that, you're going to get concentrated oil in your esophagus, which could be a problem over time because these oils are very good organic solvents and they dissolve mucous membranes very nicely, which is not a, necessarily what you want to do. So what you want to do, if you're going to ingest, you got to do it in a way that's going to disperse the oil or use a small enough amount to where it's not going to cause damage. So people that are using 10, 15 drops a day or 10 to 15 drops in their water and doing that multiple times a day, you're going to do, you're, you're going to eventually end up maybe causing yourself some, some harm. So I think I have a way I, and I'm going to be doing a video about this in which would allow people to ingest oils in a safe way. And that is basically by, ingesting the hydrosol from the oil. Now you're going to say, how am I going to produce my own hydrosol? Well, I think I have a way that I'm going to be able to show people how they can easily at home produce their own hydrosols from their existing essential oil. Very quick and easy way of doing that. Now, why is a hydrosol safe? A hydrosol gives you the maximum concentration of oil that you can actually get into water. And it's, a, it's an interesting thing because when you distill a hydrosol or when you distill a plant and you get the oil layer on top and the hydrosols below, um, you separate off the oil and that's what people buy. And then the hydrosol usually gets thrown away in most cases. But the hydrosol contains the highest concentration of oil that you can actually get in that water. It will be normally around you know 0.1 or so percent let's say um, if you try to take that amount of oil and just drop it in water and then shake it and dissolve it it won't dissolve but it's only through the distillation process that allows that water to dissolve that will allow that amount of oil to be dissolved in that water and some of those hydrosols are quite fragrant so it has to go through this steam distillation process in order to create this concentrated hydrosol. And I believe I have a way that will allow consumers to do this right in their home and recover the oil and, and you know, they put the oil in, put the water in, do the little mini distillation, and then collect the oil back and then the water, and then they have a hydrosol that if they want to ingest, they could do that. And they're not going to be in danger of damaging themselves because it's well, now the, I'm totally excited. I can't so wait to see what you have for us to be able to do that with. Yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, and that, then what about that. the second part of the question comparing the essential oils that we buy as essential oils versus the flavoring oils at the local grocery? Right. Now, um, I'm not that familiar. I mean, you're talking like, you know, they have like these different extracts and things like that, like for spices and things. And yeah, I mean, they have, you know, you can buy peppermint oil at the grocery store. What's the difference between the peppermint oil and the grocery store? A lot of times those will be in some kind of carrier already pre-diluted for cooking. Okay. So they're going to have maybe propylene glycol in there or some other carrier. Who knows? You know, um, alcohol, ethanol, you know, something there. They're not going to be pure essential oils. Okay. What about ingesting oils via a capsule, like a veggie cap? Um, a veggie cap? Well, that would be obviously uh, better in terms of not, um, you know, damaging your esophagus because it's not, 
you're bypassing that altogether and it's going straight in, into your into your gut. Um, and it, again, it depends on the concentration of the oil that you put in there. And, you know, if you use too much, it could, it depends on the oil too. You know, it's been, I mean, you could buy peppermint capsules at the pharmacy for, you know, for decades now for ir irritable bile syndrome. So it is a, it, it, it is, it can be an effective uh, way to use essential oils. But it's all a matter, again, of dosage and which oils you use and, you know, if you're doing it for the right things and you know, there's potential, uh, you know, you got to worry about killing the wrong, you know, your gut flora and things like that. And, you know, there's a whole host of things. So, I, you know, and I'm not one to advise on this, but I just tell people, you know, you need to really do your research and not just go at this just because some salesperson told you to do it. Just do right. some research on it. Thank I try you. to stick to the chemistry. I know chemistry and I'm safe there. Okay, um, Kathy. That's me. Okay, good, you're up. Yeah, my question is, um, what are the major differences between the uh, extracts, plant extracts versus the steam distillation? Um, we have situations like with frankincense, essential oil does not have boswellic acid in it, but the resin extract does have the uh, boswellic acid and what other types of chemotype differences do we see in extracts versus essential oils? Yeah, and a solvent extracted product will always differ sometimes greatly than the steam distilled essential oil product and you, you mentioned a good example there of how the steam, steam distilled frankincense will not contain boswellic acid and that's because the, the molecular weight is just too big on the boswellic acid to be to carry over in the steam distillation process. Much too big. Uh, so if you have Boswellic in your frankincense, then it's because it, there's some other process going on there um, of it being mixed with some extracted product or whatever, which doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad product. Just, just saying it's not steam distilled, completely 100% steam distilled. Um, any, there's many, many extracts out there and many different ways of doing it. You know, you have CO2 extracts, which is a very good method. Uh, but whenever you do this, you got to remember that when you do a solvent extraction, you're pulling out heavier stuff than you can in a steam distillation. So, and, and I always get, it's one of my pet peeves when people use the term, oh, it was extracted by steam distillation. That is an oxymoron. You can't say extracted by steam distillation because steam distillation is a separate process from extraction. They're completely different. Extraction is a solvent. You have to have a solvent that pulls out these processes or these molecules. Steam distillation doesn't use that kind of mechanism. It's just it's a physical separation based on different, differing basic pressure. I don't want to go into all that, but it's a different process. And there, there are many, many examples of how greatly the products can differ, whether they're solvent extracted or or steam distilled. Rose oil, let's take rose oil, that's a perfect example. If you steam distill rose, Bulgarian rose, let's take Bulgarian rose. The main component is citronella. Um, if you solve and extract the rose, the main component is phenyl ethyl alcohol. And phenyl ethyl alcohol can be 70 75% in, in like rose absolute, but in steam distilled rose, it's almost non existent. And they, you know, they're vastly different in, in aroma profile. And that's because when you, when you uh, steam distill rose petals, uh, the phenyl ethyl alcohol is, is one of the more water soluble organic molecules out there. So the water layer pulls all that phenyl ethyl alcohol out of the oil. So the oil that's collected, the steam distilled oil that's collected on top is pretty much minus the phenyl ethyl alcohol. But when you solve and extract it through an absolute process, when you first use hexane, evaporate the hexane, collect the concrete, which is then extracted with ethanol, the ethanol pulls off those more polar molecules from the waxy uh, concrete, and then evaporate the ethanol, you're left 
than with the absolute. It's pulled out the more polar aromatic molecules and that phenylethyl alcohol is there because it didn't have anywhere else to go. You, all, you also have heavier uh, waxy products as well when you do solvent extraction. And it'll be usually intensely colored when you do solvent extraction. So if you've seen Rose Absolute, it's a very intense red color, pinkish reddish color, uh, orangish even. Uh, whereas Rose Oil is kind of a pale yellow. Another great example is uh, chemat is the chemagiline in uh, steam distilled chamomile oil, a German chamomile, as you know, is a dark ink blue color, mm -hmm. and that's due to a component called uh, chemagiline, which is only produced during the steam distillation process. It's not actually in the plant. There's no okay. chemagiline in the chamomile plant, so if you do a solvent extracted uh, like a chamomile CO2, it's green in color, it has no cam uh, chemagiline. But when you steam distill it, there, there's, a, there's a molecule in, in the chamomile plant called matricin that reacts with water that forms the chemagiline, which is this intense blue color. Well, that's and, interesting. Yeah, and contrary to popular mm -hmm. belief in what people teach, chemagiline is not a sesquiterpene but it's what I classify as an aromatic hydrocarbon, but you'll get loads and loads of people out there to teach chemagiline success with chirping, but that's another topic altogether. The point Does that is- that same thing happen in blue tansy too? Yes, any blue oil that you see out there has got chemagiline in it, that's why it's blue. Yuck. Some of them are intensely blue because they have a large amount of chemagiline and some are very, very pale blue because they have just a, just a smidge of chemagiline. But that chemagiline molecule is not, it's actually not natural. So, I mean, technically it is, you know, it's, it's a man-made molecule because it took men to distill that product or people to distill that product. And that's how it was created. So that's why I say essential oils are not truly natural products. You know, you never really see a plant in the woods distilling itself. You know, they typically need people to do it. <laughs> they're naturally derived products and but even the oils any you can take any oil and it's going to have a different chemistry when you steam distill that oil than the oil itself was when it was in the plant there's all these little hydrolysis reactions that can occur so you have some minor things that go on that it may be very similar in cases but never exactly the same as the oil that's actually in the plant so that's why i like to say essential oils are naturally derived products and not natural products. People don't like it when I say that. <laughs> Did that answer everything? Yes, thank you. Okay, next up we have PJ Hanks. Hey, I'm on a bad internet, so I hope I'm clear. Ah, you're, you're coming through loud and clear. And because well, my question is, what are the, <laughs> do you have it written down, my question? Uh, go ahead, go, go ahead and ask it. Oh, you're fading in and out. I can yeah. read it for her if she needs me to. That's why we have Scylla here. Do you have it, Scylla? Oh, okay. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Okay. So, um, what, what are She here? She what back? What are the three most exciting things you've learned in your research of essential oil chemistry in the last year, and how has it affected your knowledge of how essential oils work chemically? Oh, okay. Yeah, I thought about this, and um, I'd have to say the top three in the last year are one, the Damiana oil. Yeah. Um, the production of that that we started in Mexico. Uh, that oil is amazing to me. It's, it's my favorite oil. It is just so complex and it has so many molecules in it that haven't even been identified yet. Um, if you've never smelled it, it's hard to really describe. It doesn't smell like anything else. 
Um, it's been used now in some pop and in some blends for from some large companies, but no one mainstream yet is really selling the pure, just the pure oil, which is a shame um, because it's it's just a beautiful oil. Um, and I'm looking forward to people discovering new uses for it. But right now, you know, it has the traditional and what everybody knows it for as being an aphrodisiac, and then it has anti anti anxiety properties. But I think there's a whole lot of more. There's a whole lot more there to that oil. I know that when I've diffused it, I think it probably makes me more relaxed than just about any oil out there, which is counterintuitive because one of the main components is one eight sinyol, but then you have all these sesquiterpenes in there. This complex mix mixture of these sesquiterpenes, and I mean, I could be totally wide awake and just, and that oil starts diffusing in the room and I'm just so relaxed. I'm ready to just fade away. And I don't know why that is. Uh, it's just, maybe it's cause I like it so much. I don't know, but it, it, it just seems to have more than just uh, the aromatic effect on you. You know what so I mean? Are there any current studies going on right now to determine other uses? Um, not that I know of. It's just, you know, it's not a very popular oil yet. And because it's so expensive, because the yield is so low. That's, that's why it's so expensive. But um, I'm hoping that, you know, as awareness increases, that people will start to research the therapeutic use of this oil, because I think it's got a lot of potential for many different things. Um, the second thing was probably this discovery of this new frankincense chemotype. Um, I don't know if you've, um, mm -hmm. seen some of the posts that I put on my Facebook, on the EOU yeah. Facebook page about that, but this yeah. new, um, methoxydecane type, the reason that's exciting is because methoxydecane was previously thought to be non-existent in nature. And you can go on a whole host of websites and look at, uh, you know, places like, uh, if you go to good sense, anybody ever look at the good sense company, which basically has every molecule that's used in fragrance and flavor. And it'll tell you if a molecule is, has a natural occurrence or not. There are other sites that do that too. But if you look up methoxydecane on any of these sites, it'll say does not occur in nature. And so we found this resin. Now two instances of this resin, one was claimed to be carterii, and one, the other was claimed to be Freriana, and the resins look completely different. They, one looks like the translucent kind of bigger chunks of Freriana, and the other looks like Carteria. But they both produce this, now I've found these two that produce this methoxydecane type of oil. And at first we thought, well, maybe there's something going on here where there's a reaction occurring with something in the resin that's forming this methoxydecane. In some cases, we're getting up at 40% methoxydecane. And so I said, well, let's, let's, let's see if we can prove if the methoxydecane decane is actually in the resin or is it coming as a secondary process? So I extracted the resin with uh, methylene chloride and then evaporated off, concentrated it down, injected that extract on the GC, and lo and behold, the methoxydecane was in the extract so it's not a reaction it's actually in it's actually in the resin so the plant is actually making a resin with methoxydecane in it. Oh. That, that much we know and it's an interesting odor it's 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 a very different odor than any of the other frankincense and most people haven't smelled it because it, it's it's very rare most people won't go to the trouble to produce it because the resin that produces this oil is only is produced in less than 1% yield, whereas out of the normal carteria, they get 6%. So it's a huge difference. So when people find this resin, the, the, the like in Somalia, when they get it and then it goes to the distillery, when they start distilling this, they usually throw it out. But we've actually acquired a bunch of this resin because we're interested in our research for research. And um, I think we actually were able to get about two tons of this resin that nobody wanted. Wow. Wow. So now would this be considered a protected resource um, 
is it in such low quantity in the wild that it would have to be protected such as rosewood is or but no one knows you know you don't know it's like you don't know what it's which resin it is until you distill it okay so we've isolated a region now we know one region where this was coming from but it's not the majority of the resin coming from the region so it's only it's still a lot to be done, a lot to figure out. And we can't publish it, and we haven't found, and we tried to publish it in um, Journal of Essential Oil Research, but we're not sure, now I'm not even sure about, is it really Carterii that we got it, this last batch from, is it, or is it something else? And we have to do genetic testing and all that stuff, because they won't publish the result without a concrete identification of the plant material that was used. And I was like, well, well, that's not the interesting thing here. The interesting thing here is that chemical that we found in a natural product. We can figure out that later. <laughs> Let's just get this. In. So I'm trying to find a journal that will let us publish a basis on the basis of just the chemistry of finding a, a molecule that wasn't in nature. And uh, so I'm hoping to be able to do that soon. Now, what would that particular molecule, how would that affect the human physiology? <laughs> compared to the different other chemotypes? Therapeutic, you mean how it would be used therapeutic? Yeah, a therapeutic value to it. I have no, I have no idea. None, okay. Because <laughs> there's really not that many ethers, which is just an ether. There's really not that many ethers in essential oils. So I don't, I don't know how it would affect it. And the third thing would be, um, and it has to also do with frankincense. We've do, been doing a lot of experimentation with developing new processes of, of, uh, of making frankincense oil. And I developed a new process um, that through this, when we take the resin through this new process that we've developed, I can get 30% uh, yield out of the resin through this process, which is unheard of. Like I said, normally it's 6%. And wow. um, and up to ten percent in some like soccer, I think you can get up to ten percent. But we haven't really even tried it with soccer yet. We've just been dealing this new method of mainly with uh, with uh, Carteria, and we've done it with pop uh, Popyrifera and Buriana too. But uh, yeah, this process it gives us a thirty percent uh, oil yield on this particular process. Um, but the, even the more exciting thing is that a byproduct of this process gives us this beautiful boswellic acid. It's a frankincense powder, boswellic acid, and it also has some of the oil retained in it. So it's this nice, soft powder, like talc almost, feel in its feel. It has a beautiful aroma of frankincense oil of the best frankincense oil you've ever smelled in your life and it, it's rich in boswellic acid and no i haven't really found a big company yet that's been interested in it so i think i'm just going to take it to market myself well i can give you my address robert and you can send me some i'll sample it for you well i'm going to be i'm going to be announcing it i'll be announcing on the on the eou facebook page i mean i don't i don't want to get and sell an essential oils this is not an essential oil product so i thought well you know, nobody seems to really want it or be interested. I'm sure there's people out there who are interested in boswellic acid and a good one. Because if you buy boswellic acid now, it comes from China typically. And it's made from uh, an ethanol extract of serrata, which is the cheap Indian frankincense. Uh -huh. And it has no odor. It's just like sand. You know, and this, and it, this is the stuff that I'm making here is the only... Um, Boswellic acid ex carteriae in the world. Nobody's using carteriae to do this. Wow. So I've already used it in some products. Um, I wish I could show you some pictures. Of, uh, I've used it on, I had some uh, like a, a lip, like a skin uh, lip area where I had it examined by a doctor. He said it was basically precancerous from sun exposure and whatnot. And I started putting this stuff on it. And I can show you pictures of before and after. 
and it's gone, just completely gone. And other people in my office have used it for their kids for um, like psoriasis and things like this, rashes and whatnot. Put it put it into like a vitamin E base, uh-huh. an odorless vitamin E base, and it just makes a beautiful lotion because you don't have to add any fragrance to it either. Once you add it, it smells like frankincense. It oh, so wow. it's like it's like you've got your your nutraceutical and your fragrance all in one. Just add it to the product that's ready to go. And don't they say that res? Oh, sorry. That's okay. Go ahead. Um, don't they say the resins have more of the anti-cancer properties than the oils do in the research studies? Yeah, that that's where the about? the anti-cancer activity is in the boswellic acids and the beta keto boswellic acids and things of that nature. The oil is when people. I don't know why people are getting on this thing about the oil being used for cancer because the oil is not going to help you with cancer. But what you're talking about is the anti-cancer type of. From what I've read, again, I'm not, you know, that's not mm-hmm. my area. Right. I know. But what I've read it's the boswellic acids that are, are what causes it or what have the so properties. You would think there'd be a great big market for doing more research and studying that. Yes. Yes. Well, I think you're going to see more of it, but. If you want this, if, if people out there want boswellic acid and they want a good one, this product is better than anything on the market. So how many other products do you think were, it's the, what's left over that a lot of the distillers think, oh, that's just the junk left at the end that actually has medicinal properties in it that could be used for therapeutic purposes. Right, well, that's the thing. When, when you distill frankincense oil, traditional method, um, it just forms this sludge, this big mass of sludge that they just, it's bio waste. They, they have to find a way to dispose of it and they don't really have any ways of recovering. It, it costs too much for them to try to recover the boswellic acid out of it after that process uh-huh. to be worth trying to bring it to market. So no one, it just gets thrown away. Right. Are there, do you think there are there other plants though that have constituents after being distilled that because of that very nature that it's just too cost prohibitive for them to get anything further out of it? Right. Yes, I think there's other potential out there and we're investigating other um, materials to take through this process. I'll be doing clove soon. That's another one. I think it works really well with products that are high yielding like frankincense and produce a lot of oil. So we'll be doing it that I've done it with cardamom makes a beautiful cardamom card, most beautiful cardamom you've ever seen in your life, but it's not, it, it it's not really uh, something you do for the higher yields. Cause it, there's not as much yield in cardamom as there is in frankincense. But if you want a better cardamom, this process makes the, the best cardamom you've ever smelled. Well, without giving away your trade secret, I mean, what is the difference in yet this new process that you're doing compared to what's typically done? Yeah, I can't talk about it. This, <laughs> the process is licensed by another company right now. The technology okay. has already been, been gobbled up, so I can't really talk about that right now. Could you spell that first oil you mentioned started with a D? Could you Damiana, yeah. Uh-huh. D-A-M-A. No, oh, sorry. D A M I A N A. Dami. Oh, thank you. Like it's just like it sounds. If you Damiana. spoke Spanish, if you speak Spanish, it's just like you spell it in Spanish. Right. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, let's see, we have Abby up next. Yes. Thank you very much. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead, Abby. Okay. All right, Um, when learning about essential oil chemistry, what are the most important aspects that should be learned first to build a solid primer slash foundation to further master the field of study? Okay, good question. Um, You don't have to be an organic chemist to make use of the chemical knowledge in essential oils. It wouldn't hurt, but 
a basic a basic uh, familiar familiarity with chemistry helps. Um, the most important thing to grasp in essential oil chemistry, and I don't know if any of you have watched my course videos that are online, but I try to eliminate, I try to separate the wheat from the chaff and focus on here's what you need to know. Here's the basic stuff that's important. And if you just focus on a few basic things, like you got to understand a little bit about carbon and understand that carbon always has four bonds. And well, actually you need to understand carbon, oxygen, hydrogen. Those are the three most important things. And if you know that carbon has four bonds, oxygen has two bonds, hydrogen has one bond. And if you know um, they're, how they come together and learn the functional groups, what they, what they look like uh, in terms of their structure, how they look and, you can look at a molecule and you can determine what its structure is or what its uh, functional group is. You can classify the molecule as an ester or as an alkene or as a, or as a monoterpene or aldehyde or whatever. That would be very useful to be able to recognize or classify a molecule based upon its name ending is also very useful. These are all things I go over in my course because every um, molecule, the, the ending and the name, usually gives away what class it is. Now, there's some exceptions to that, but usually it does. Um, you know, those are the kinds of basic things that I would try to learn first. And then you can build upon that from there. And, it, and then learn, and then take that, and then look at some GC analysis reports. And then, and try to, you know, maybe get an idea of, from uh, literature reports or things like that, what the profile, the chemical profile for the different oils should look like and what those main components in those profiles, what class they are. And that helps you make decisions about, you know, what type of oil you're doing, what the chemotype of the oil is and how you might use it, things of that nature. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, we got... Simone up next. She's not here, so let Scylla, we'll let you answer that or ask that question. Uh, what, if any, is the difference in chemical constituents between steam distilled and cold press citrus oils? Okay. Well, I wish Simone was here because that's a good question. Cool. Yes, there is a difference. There is a difference in that. Um, the steam distilled, just like we talked about earlier is only going to pull out the lighter volatile components. Um, whereas if you cold press the oil, it's going to pull out heavier stuff and waxes and things of that nature that won't come over in the steam distillation process. And the pressing, the pressed oils will also have, you know, pretty good color to them. Whereas the steam distilled will be very pale in color. So, and the steam distilled is going to be much higher typically in limonene than the others, because limonene is your main component in all the citruses. Um, in some cases, the citrus that's steam distilled is a better choice because it's safer in that it doesn't have these uh, phototoxic components in them, like lime. Let's take lime, for example, uh, bergamot, lime, those things. They have, when you coat, when you press those peels, there's these. Um, phototoxic components, the furanocoumarins, the brigaptines, there's, those are kind of equivalent, equivalent names for the same types of molecules. So you, if you're gonna use those oils on the skin, you don't want those phototoxic components in there. So there are, you can get cold pressed oils that are FCC which, or FCF, which means um, furanocoumarin free which means they've been further processed after the pressing to get rid of the furanocoumarins. Like you can buy bergamot FCF, or also you could see it named as bergamot bergaptine free. But those small amounts, and we're talking like 0.5% of let's say bergaptine in, in a bergamot. If you put that on your skin and go out and get hit with UV light and sun or something, you can cause some serious damage to your skin. So 
in those cases, if you know, if you wanted to use like say a lime or a lemon, and you know that product is gonna be used on the skin, it's probably a better choice to go with the distilled version or an FCF version if it's available. Um, that's just the nature of citrus. You know, Some citrus are worse than others, but the bergamot and the lime are, the, are pretty bad in terms of these furanic coumarins. So would you say in general that um, the steam distilled citrus oils are safe to put in products like let's say a sunscreen or a lotion? Yes, that, they would They would be much much safer and preferable for products like that, that you know it's gonna be on the skin in sunlight. Okay, or under even in tanning beds? Um, it, it wouldn't have the phototoxicity that the pressed ones would, but I don't know how, you know, at what concentration those things ultimately could cause some other process, you know, some other thing damage from being in a tanning bed or something like that. I, I just don't know. So better than, than uh, pressed in terms of that application, but I don't really know about how safe or what concentration it would be safe if you're going to go into the tanning bed. Okay, um, next up is Rhonda. In your opinion, what is the future of essential oils at the rate that we are using them? Popularity, oh. of, oils, popularity of oils is increasing and new companies are popping up every day. At this rate of usage, can the industry be sustained? At this rate of usage, can the industry be sustained? Yes and no. No, it can't be sustained if there's not increased production. And meaning there needs to be new fields and new uh, entire new distilleries generated in non-traditional areas in order to sustain you know, this level of consumer uh, the increase in consumer demand that's come in the last say five years it's been uh, it it's been different than any time in the history of essential oils um, it's, I've never seen anything like it. I've been in the business for 20 years and I've never seen anything like what's happened in the last five years um, so yes we have to um, and that's part of what I've been in, in, involved with is finding these new um, production uh, locations and things for non-traditional locations for production of oils. Um, I, I don't know if you, any of you follow some of the things that have been done, like with the, um, the some of the, um, uh, what is it, what they call it? Um, well, anyway, um, non-traditional locations, like for example, Douglas Fir in New Zealand. That was one example of one that we did. Uh, the beautiful product, like probably the best Douglas fir I've ever seen. And I just, you know, I I was friends with the the guy who started that project there. He brought it to me, and then I showed it to DoTerra. They ended up grabbing it, and now they it's a it's a great product because not only is it a great oil, but those trees were um, actually a nuisance in the mountains of New Zealand and they were spraying pesticides, okay. millions of dollars of pesticides to get rid of these Douglas fir trees, these young Douglas fir trees, cause they were taking over everything. So Michael Sly, the guy that, um, who contacted me with this project and said, Hey, look, I got this, this beautiful oil that I had unlimited resources basically that if I could get, the government on board to stop spraying it i can harvest these things free distill it and instead of dumping all these chemicals in the environment we actually have a product now that's useful and that people want and so it actually came out very nicely in that case so those kinds of projects are what i'm looking for and what i try to you know i get people contacting me all the time and you know i, I try to follow up on and there's been others, and that's just, I don't have time to talk about all of them, but, you know, we have to continue to do this and expand into locations where we 
don't didn't really look at before looking at producing more things here in the United States and other countries in Central America, South America. Um, that's the kinds of things we've got to do Africa to um, sustain this demand because it's only going to get worse in terms of demand as time goes on. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Brooke. Next. Hi, yes. So my question is, how is it that the chemistry of a tree's trunk different than the leaves? For example, through your <laughs> I can never seem to say the second part. <laughs> Flicata. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there's, um, so there's concern about the thuja. I've had a few conversations with um, other people in the industry, and it, it wasn't something I was aware of until the question came up about there being um, toxicity levels in parts of that. And so I personally wanted to have a better understanding of how, how is it that one part of that tree doesn't produce the same level? I, I don't know how that works. If it does produce toxicity and we, there's a way of extracting, or is it just completely different than the um, leaves? Right. Okay. Good question. Um, the, you're talking about Thuja Plicata, which is the Western red cedar wood oil. And the leaf, the cedar leaf oil has a large amount of Thujone in it. Now this is um, natural. This is totally what the, the leaf oil should, but when you distill the wood, it's a completely different chemistry. There is no Thujone in the wood at all. So, it's not, it's not removed, it's not anything like that, it's just a different oil, completely different oil. Um, the, the thujone that's in the cedar leaf is, consists of alpha and beta thujone. I believe it's the beta thujone that's the bad actor, the, the worst one of the two. Uh, but thujone occurs in you know, a few other oils, war, uh, wormwood, mugwort, tansy, and not blue tansy, but tan, like, just Idaho tansy, that kind of thing, Tennessee and Bulgaria. So it is a concern. It's considered a, a neurotoxin. And when people, uh, and I actually did a post on this um, a couple of years ago because people were raising a stink about it. And I was like, look, the wood oil doesn't have any food shown, so stop scaring people. <laughs> they were railing against somebody selling this oil and claiming right. it was toxic and all this stuff. But the wood oil is completely, completely, like there's totally nothing really in common with between the two. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. What about cedar leaf oil? Cedar leaf. Yeah. That, yeah, we did that. So I said, yeah, we talked about it. Cedar leaf has the thujone. Yes. Okay. Cedar leaf. And there's, there's two types of cedar leaf. There's the thuja placata and there's the thuja occidentalis. And they both have high thujone. So I guess it's Western red cedar versus Eastern cedar, I guess. I mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. uh, there's similar, similar oils, but, you know, have some varying difference in percentages and whatnot. But yes, don't typically people stay away from the cedar leaf for therapeutic use, but it has, it's a beautiful, oil. I mean, it smells really nice, but you just got to be careful how you use it. Okay, and last we have Marla. Hi, guys. Uh, here we go. <laughs> go How you doing? Pretty good. All right. Being an everyday user of essential oils, could our bodies get immune to the compounds in the oils and not be as effective <laughs> the first time of use? Uh, yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, Usually when you talk about people becoming or immune to a, a medication or whatnot or becoming um, desensitized to it or that, and things like that, that happens because those medications are not, are just basically single chemicals that are causing the action, right? So it's a much easier for your body to become, to build up a tolerance to a single chemical 
than it is to a complex mixture like an essential oil. Essential oils are can be hundreds of molecules in, in one essential oil. So, you know, it depends on the oil, of course. It would, you know, methyl, you know, uh, birch or wintergreen, which is mainly just methyl salicylate, it's going to be much easier to build up a, a you know, tolerance to that than some complicated oil like mm. lavender or rose or something like that. So, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but I'm going to say it's much more difficult for that to happen with a com a com the complexity of an essential oil than it can with say a drug that's one molecule. Does that help? Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. What about the people that uh, consistently use only one oil or one particular blend? Can you talk to the sensitization possibility of that, that you know, through time, through, you know, consistent use of only one particular oil, it could possibly lead to sensitization? Um, yes, it could. Um, if they're using it, especially if they're using it neat, that's going to really accelerate any sensitization possibilities. Um, that's why it's best to always dilute the oil if you're going to put on the skin. Um, and I did a video about this as well, about why it's not only better from a safety standpoint, but actually better from a usage standpoint. You're going to, if you use a carrier, less of the oil is going to, you know, if you put a neat oil on your skin, the, the good bulk of it's going to evaporate quickly. But if okay. it's in a carrier, the, the carrier keeps it around longer and facilitates its absorption in, into the skin much better than just slathering it on neat when you and when you do it neat it's going to dry out your skin so i always tell people oh. i would i would never put any essential oil on um, in neat form um even if it's a safe oil like lavender or tea tree or whatever simply because it's just not as effective not because it's necessarily going to hurt you but you know why take the chance of it hurting you when it's more effective to use them in dolution? Right. So what's your add I'm anything? Sorry. Yeah, what's your favorite dilution? Like oh. coconut oil or what's your favorite to put in essential oils? Yeah, my favorite uh, carrier is fractionated coconut, yeah, for sure. <laughs> because it's a uh, light, it's easy to use, it, it washes out of things easy. It, it's light enough to where you can, you know, put it in a pump sprayer and spray it on, you know, an application. Um, it doesn't go rancid. There's so many advantages to fractionated coconut. And it's food grade. You can eat it. You know, it's used in salad dressings all the time. Scylla, did you want to add anything to the uh, sensitization topic? Yeah. That was really good, thank you. Um, yeah, it's the undiluted every day that causes the issues. And I wanted to address uh, the, her question about the immune system getting used to, even when we use them as medicine, we're not gonna build up that resistance uh, like we do with antibiotics. So that may be kind of what you were looking for. I do think it's a good idea to vary what you use uh, on your body and in the air, but there are some things that, you know, like one of my first blends, it makes me feel good. So I'm going to, I use that all the time still, my perfume blend, you know, so it's, it, it doesn't do harm to use something all the time as long as you're doing it safely. Right. What is your favorite carrier oil, Scylla? I like the fractionated uh, for doing clients because it's lightweight and it washes out of the sheets. But my own personal, I, I, right now with cold weather, I want a heavier. So I add uh, to fractionated, I'll add maybe some avocado, apricot kernel, um, evening primrose, and a lot of other additives. I don't just use one thing. I make a blend of the carriers, uh, which is just as important as the oils that go in it. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, I think that's all the questions. Does anybody have any final 
remarks, questions before we wrap it up? I just you. want to say I think we're all looking forward to your boswellic um, acid powder. I think we're all very excited about that. <laughs> I'll be posting about that. Samples and, and let us do trial runs and see, and we'll feed back our results. And then yeah. that's a great testimony from your <laughs> I have to find a way to get... I have to find a way to get that out because I'm well, not going to get involved with shipping. Well, you know, May, I'll get it out there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one thing I wanted to add to the Damiana conversation, I've started, uh, my daughter is, is studying herbology. She made Damiana tincture. And mm. I've been having that at night along with sniffing on the oil. And man, it is a great sedative. So. Yeah. You know, well, I'm glad somebody else is, is seeing that because I was thinking maybe I was crazy there for a minute. No, I think it's quite sedative. Maybe, I mean, adding it maybe to some lavender, marjoram, knock somebody out. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking I need to add that to my calm blend. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, everyone, for uh, your question for be willing to participate in this. This is kind of a groundbreaking thing to be able yeah. to do this. We've got people from another continent participating and yeah. uh, this so is can you hear the time frame of when maybe that uh, unit that you were talking about for our the home hydrosol yeah. making what what's the time frame on when it's gonna hit market? Uh, it's actually a product that's out there now that I'm playing around with to see if it's going to work for people in this capacity. And if it looks good, then I'm going to go ahead and put it out there and let people know about it. Great. That's a good idea. I don't like people drinking hydrosols unless they make them themselves because of the contamination. So I think I, I'd go for that. That would yeah. be fun. And that's a great idea. Yeah. And it'll, see, another thing about that, it, it allows you to make your hydrosol fresh. Yes. Because hydrosols, if they store for long periods of time, they can get bacteria and stuff in them. Now you're saying you would you make it from the oil. You don't even make exactly. it. Exactly. Yes. Wow. Because, you know, nobody, ha you know, you got to have something small enough to do in, a, in your yeah. house. Yeah. And nobody has a big enough thing to put, you know, right. 50 kilos right. of leaves in. Right. So. Okay. But here's the deal, Rob, you're the making it from the oil. You're not, it's not going to be the same as if you're hydrosol from the steel with all the water. Right. Soluble content. No, it won't be exactly the right. same, but it, it will actually be more concentrated than a normal in hydrosol. Oil, but not in all the other in the oil. Yes. In the oil. Yeah. Right. The water, you know, the, all the carbon. But that's what people are doing now is they're drinking oil. Right. This is true. Yeah. This is the safe way to, to drink yeah. your oil if you want to drink the oil. Yeah, I see what you're saying. That's perfect. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks, everyone. Thank you. And, Thank, uh, you. Thank you. Thank I'll you very much. Look, look forward to the video being put up soon. Oh, yeah. We'll be following Thank that. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye